We are on board the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line and we are filming the Jazz Archive Series for Hamilton College. Our guest today is Frank West. Pleased to have you. Hello, thank you. Nice to have you here. I'm glad you. I would like to ask you uh, if you could relate to us just uh, how are you involved? You were one of the first to involve the flute in the big band context and in a jazz improvisation context. Uh, tell us about that. What led you to, uh, to pick up that instrument as a jazz horn? Oh, well, that started years ago. When I was in high school, uh, my teacher, uh, Henry L. Grant, who was uh, also Duke Ellington's teacher, and Billy Taylor, Dr. Billy Taylor, and I studied with him. And he was uh, the orchestra teacher, you know. And uh, he gave me a flute to take home, you know. So I took it home, and, and after fooling with it a while, I realized that I couldn't do it without a teacher, you know. And at the time, I, you know, I, I couldn't afford a teacher, and there wasn't one available that I knew of. So I said, I'll just let it rest until I can get to it, you know. So uh, at that time, uh, there was uh, a fellow named uh, Wayman Carver, who was in the Chick Webb Orchestra. And uh, he played with a group within the orchestra called uh, Little Chicks, you know. And uh, that uh, inspired me to want to play the flute because he was the first that I know of to do it, you know. So and he, and he recorded a lot with uh, Benny Carter and, uh, you know, the musicians that were recording at that time, you know. So, and, and then uh, after I, uh, well, what, what happened actually, uh, I was studying the flute, you know, when I got a chance to study it, I was under the GI Bill, you know, I got a chance to go back to school and study the flute, so I did. And uh, basically, evidently, was looking for tenor player, you know, so he kept calling, calling. He called for a couple of years, and I told him I was doing something, you know, and I couldn't leave right then, you know, so he just kept calling. Periodically, he would call. And uh, in the meantime, I, I got a degree in, uh, a bachelor's degree in flute, and uh, we got together, and, and I joined Basie. Well, the thing was, <clears throat> At the time, uh, uh, I mean, what what made me go with him? Because actually, I had quit the road five years before I joined Basie. I, you know, I'd given up on the road because I, I first left home in 1939. So I, you know, I, uh, he said that, uh, well, Frank, I think I can give you more exposure than you've had, you know. So that's what made me join him. I said maybe that is what I need, you know. So. I went with him. Well, uh, well, Billy Eckstein had told him, you know, about me. And uh, then when I got in the band, well, uh, Don Redmond had asked him, say, you ever heard him play flute? He said, no. He said, y'all let him play flute, you know. So, so bass told me, you know, whatever solos you have, you know, on tenor, whatever you got, if you want to play it on flute, just go ahead and play it, you know. So that's how that came about, you know. So well, I'd been I'd been playing, you know, flute for a while. What was what was the audience response like? Did they like it? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it was different, you know, because wasn't nobody really doing that. Uh, Sam Most was playing, and uh, Jerome Richardson was playing a little, but you know, it wasn't. Nobody had really heard that would have, you know, really. Sam Most had done some things with, uh, uh, I forget who it was, uh, one of the bands, might have been, might have been Don Redman, I don't know. Because we used to play whenever he, they would, you know, come to watch, you know, whenever we ran in there, we used to play duets together, you know, and things like that. But there really wasn't 
too much of it around, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of good flute players, but nobody playing jazz, you know. Yeah. Right. We've been interested in seeing if we can give some of our students an idea of what it must have been like to live on the road. Like, and, and you did a couple different periods of it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, is it all it's cracked up to be, or is it? It's rough. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a, well, in, in the first place, it's physical, you know. And if you're not... If you know, if your body's not in good shape, you're not really gonna make it. Because see, you know, you everything is without a schedule. You know, so you don't eat it on time, you don't sleep on time, you don't do anything at the same time. So it's mm. just you know that kind of life. And sometimes you have to work without sleep and food. You know, it all depends on what happens. You know, the hardest part of it is getting to the gig. After you get there, it's not not hard to play, but I mean, the, yeah, the, it's the parts in between, right? Yeah, yeah, everything that's involved in the transportation and the lodging and all of that, and you know, it makes it difficult. Uh, what was uh, relate for us? Maybe one of your worst experiences on the road, or one of your best experiences? <laughs> I don't know. I, can't. <laughs> I don't know. I really can't remember. Uh, was there a certain etiquette among uh, the players and about getting the solos? How did you decide between you, know, you and Frank Foster were on the band for this? Well, time, that's, right? that's up to the band leader. That's the band leader. Yeah, he, you know, yeah. he says you take this or you take that. Yeah, know, whatever. Yes, it's up to him. You know. What about uh, your writing? Were were you writing before the Basie band? And yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, Cause well I, I've been. You know, writing, I think I did. <laughs> I did my first commercial arrangement uh, in 1940, I think. It's a thing for an old uh, entertainer. I don't know, you probably never heard of Fifi D'Orsi from Canada. I did the uh, arrangement on uh, Alouette for her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> years, years, years ago. So, and then, you know, I did a couple of things while I was working with Blanche Calloway. Well, I was with Blanche at the time, you know, 1940. So, uh, that, that's that. And then, uh, all in the service, I guess, for about, uh, over, over four years, I had, I had a band. I had a 17-piece band in service. And, uh, we were overseas quite a while, over uh, over three years, we were way over three years. And uh, our band was, you know, always the best band wherever we went, you mm -hmm. know, so we did. We ended up being the general's band, you know, after our first parade, you know, that was, the order would come out, we were the general's band. And during that time, that's when we, uh, we had just come up from uh, West Africa, and uh, we went, I mean, me, I was an assistant band leader, and the band leader and I went down to special service to see what they had, you know, for the band, so, because we were a regular army band. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> we found out that there was, uh, they were getting a tour together for Josephine Baker, so uh, we put our name down, you know, and, and uh, Josephine came out and auditioned the band, and. We played a few of our things, and she said, yeah, now let's see how you do it with, with my things, you know. So we did uh, as a love, lull in my life, and then uh, I remember I had to conduct uh, Felix Cadiz, you know. So we did that, and she said, you got it, you know. So we toured all around North Africa, you know, with Josephine Baker. Uh -huh. This is why you're still in the service? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that must have been... Uh, yeah, well, I, I, we, we, we had... Uh, we had a big band. We had special authorization for 55 pieces, you mm -hmm. know, and the Army band was only 28. Oh. But our band leader was a friend of President Roosevelt, so we had special authorization, and he used to uh, recruit uh, professional musicians who were on the road and about to be drafted, you know. And he had a, a deal where it, if you came into the band with him, 
you didn't have to take any basic training and you got a rating the first day you came in. So, you know, we never did anything but play music. That was right. it, so. We didn't have to go through all that other stuff. And how many years did you spend with Basie? Well, over 11. Yeah. Yeah. Milton and I joined the band the same day. You know, I'll be done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, uh, we've been trying to get diff people's different uh, takes on what made the Basie rhythm section, uh, the Basie rhythm section. It's like a, a term in jazz, you know. Well, Basie and, and did. what was there? Well, Basie did. <laughs> yeah, it was Basie's rhythm section. Was it his direction or? Yeah, well, it yeah. was his, his style of playing, you know, that, that did it. He had a way of, of, of being effective, you know, without being overbearing, you know. Without playing too much, most most uh, pianists would uh, with the, with the, that type of band, you know, they they try to play too much when it's really not uh, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Because you see, you have the guitar keeping the rhythm already, you know, uh -huh. you don't need all yeah. of that, you know. So it's yeah. up to you to complement what's being played in the band and enhance it in a way, you know, that's you know. It helps not to, what the, you know, usually you get a piano player, he wants to be a piano player, but you don't need a piano player, you know what I mean? You need somebody, a musician that knows how to complement the band, you yeah. see? So that's what Basie was better than good at. <laughs> yeah, he's a master of that. Can you uh, tell us anything about, or contrast for us, what they call the riff style? That they played in the, the the south, the bands from the southwest, as as compared to the big bands on the east coast. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't know. What that is. I don't know. People name things. I don't know what it, what is. You know. I guess they call it the Kansas City style of uh, creating riffs and and so forth. Oh, you mean for arrangements? Yeah. 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 Well. Well, that's a, a bands, you know, they've done that. Uh, all band, most bands, when they first start out, you know, they start out like that because they don't have any music. So you got to start like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Basic band, when I was with Bill Eckstein's band, they had started out the same way, you know. You start out, you got two or three arrangements, and you got to do a job four or five hours, and you got to have a book so you make up you know, music <laughs> as you go. You know? yeah. Had an arrangement on uh, uh, every day that Joe Williams did. The band was playing it hit. You know, when Joe Williams came in the band, he didn't have no music. So, you know, basically played the introduction and we started playing the music, you uh -huh. know. And uh, Ernie Wilkins just put the introduction on it and, and copied just what we played. He wrote what, just what we played. That's great. That's yeah. like uh, so that's arranging in reverse almost. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, well, well that's, the way, that's the way it is always. Music is always played before it's written. Yeah. So it's usually that's the reason f that when you see something written a certain way, the, the whoever wrote it meant for it to sound the way he heard it. Mm -hmm. See, because the, the, it comes from the playing, not the writing to the playing, from the playing to the writing, you know. That's the way it, it usually goes. You know, they also say that is true with the uh, arrangers. The arrangers, basically, they say, listen to the soloist. That's what I mean. Well, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. yeah. They hear it, and then they, they write, you know. What was it like uh, playing in different parts of the world with a bassy band? Oh, we always had a good following, yeah. Yeah. the band was hot. That was one of the best bands Basie ever had. Yeah, that's the band that made him rich. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah, this, this band was tight. I had forgotten, actually, how good the band was until I, I, I was listening to those uh, Mosaic recordings. And then uh, it, it came back to me <laughs> how good that band was. You know, It was like one person playing, you know, everybody was. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a good band. Well, basically, he knew how to do that, you know. He didn't bug nobody, you know. 
he just let it stay there until the cats got it together. You know, and then when they got it together, he knew what to do with it. You know, but he, did, you know, you just the fellas in the band did all of that. You know, he didn't know too many people, really. You know, I mean, musicians. You know. When he want somebody, you know, he said, "Hey, Magic, I, I, I need a trumpet player. I need a trumpet. I need a bass. I need this. I need that." And you know, I'd tell him who to call. You know, I got, I got Eddie Jones in the band, Bill Hughes, Sonny Cohen, Eric Dixon, Dad Jones, uh, uh, what a new genuineness. <laughs> oh, Al Aaron's. Oh, yeah, I got a whole lot of people in the band. You know, and when I left, I recommended Danny Turner. But he didn't know Danny, so he, you know, he didn't know that Danny could play lead. So uh, he uh, got Bobby Plater. He knew Bobby Plater could play lead. But I, I recommended Dan, Danny Turner to him when I left. Were you happy switching from the tenor to the alto? Was it didn't make no much difference. Yeah. Much then, but I, I would have made a lot more money if I'd have quit then. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> If I had left for, because, you know, uh, things were more busy in New York, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but as it turned out, it was all right. Because uh, New York wasn't as busy when I quit five years later, but uh, I made the transition without missing the payday, you know. Mm. I just went into right the from, studios? And I went yeah. into Broadway. Yeah, yeah. I just went right yeah, in the studio. Huh. I went right from one thing to another without missing right. the payday, so, you know. Right. But if I'd quit earlier, then I, I would have made a lot more money, you know, because there was a lot more things happening in New York at that time, commercially, you know. How do you feel that the studio work was different from the big band playing? Oh, well, you know, it's, well, it's, it's a different, different ball game altogether, you know. Because uh, when you're playing uh, creative music, jazz, you know, your identity is important, but when you're playing commercial music, you have to sacrifice your identity to sound like everybody else, you know. So it's a, it's a different thing altogether. Have you uh, noticed when Basie was uh, recording, did they ever there were certain times when you might have done, uh, like uh, there was a Broadway record, I think that was done. Was how did he fit into the the changing times? And the change well, I don't know. I wasn't there then. Yeah. See, I've been away from the band over thirty years. Yeah. So by the time he started doing that, you know, I, I wasn't there. Right. I think Eric Dixon was. Yeah. Was yeah, yeah. I wasn't there. No. Yeah, I told him to call Eric because, he, you know, every time, you know, I was playing third alto. And he put me there because he knew I could play first. So if Marshall wasn't there, oh. you know, I, he, he always kept somebody in the third chair oh. that could play lead, you know. Yeah. So that he would never be without a lead player, you know. So uh, he kept changing, looking for a tenor player, and it was bugging me, you know. Because I'd played the book for, what, five, six years, you know what I mean? I knew what it was supposed to be, and he got all these people coming in there and messing. I said, man, look, you better get your tenor player, because, you know. Yeah, well, who, who can I call? I said, call Eric Dixon, Shit, you know. So he called Eric, and Eric came in, and he stayed there, you know. Yeah. Who were some of your favorite uh, drummers and bass players during that period that you were in? Oh, well, Kenny Clark. You, you mean with bass band? Yeah. <clears throat> well, there were only two, uh, Gus Johnson. And Gus Johnson got sick, so uh, we were trying out different drummers. <clears throat> and uh, they didn't make it, you know. He even, even called Papa Joe back, but it, Papa Joe didn't fit with that band, you know. He was, it was a different thing. So uh, one day he said, Hey, Magic, come on, go with me. I had a little drummer down here. Let's go catch him, you know. So we went down to the Regal Theater in Chicago, me and bass, you know, and Sonny Payne was there with, I think, maybe Erskine Hawkins or somebody, you know. 
And he said, what you think, Magic? I said, yeah, he can make it, you know. Mm -hmm. So he, he eventually he got uh, Sonny and Joe Williams came at the same time, you know. So that's when uh, the band really, really started to get together, you know. Before that, you know, I mean, I, when I joined the band, I, I thought, I said, this is the saddest band I ever played with in my life, you know. <laughs> well, it, well it, it, was the, it was the situation, you know, that we were in. We had to do two weeks in the band box opposite Duke Ellison. And, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's you know. Some competition. <laughs> that ain't no competition. We were out of the park. We wasn't even, you know, we wasn't in it, you know. We, we used to listen, Benny, Benny Powell and I used to listen to tapes from that very far. We'd listen to those tapes and laugh because the band was so sad. It was just <laughs> funny, you know. And Duke was fired up, you know. But we had a lot of spirit, but that, that was all, you know. <laughs> and the band was just sad, that's all. <laughs> that was funny. You talking about that well, another time I was, I was really in Paris. I was working with this dance hall band, and I was, what, I was, I guess, 16, 17 years old, something like that, you know. And this band leader, he booked a battle of music with our band and Glenn Gray and the Casaloma in Griffith Stadium. I've never been so embarrassed in all my life. Man. It, was, <laughs> it was really, really depressing. <laughs> Glenn Gray, he was, that was a pretty popular group at the time. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, they were hot. They had, you know, and like they were out there in, in yeah. tails and, you yeah. know, and, and they had and all this shit. They would, they, they had, you know, what the hell is it? We were just, a, you know, a, a jump, uh, I guess about 13, it's about 12, 13 pieces, man, you know. <laughs> really embarrassing. <laughs> How'd you guys all get your nicknames? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> just, yeah, I've had a million of them, you know. Yeah? yeah oh. Get a million of them. I wanted yeah, to ask yeah. you, uh, you know, you did study technically, but... Uh, can you relate to us how you feel like the bands themselves were little universities? Oh yeah, well that's always, you know, that's when, you know, you, 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 uh, you always try to s surround yourself with the best, you know, you, you know. You always want to play with somebody that's better than you, you know, you, so it's, you know. And some people are just more compatible than others. I mean, it, you know, they can all be great, but they don't have to be compatible musically, you know. So when you get, you know, a situation where the chemistry is right and the people are compatible and they know what they're doing, you know, it's, you know, and then they bring in, you know, styles and information and, and experience from different, you know, different places so it, you know, it works together. And then they, they have a mutual respect for each other, you know, musically, so it... Could you uh, relate to us how, uh, you know, for instance, uh, I see bands play, and uh, it seems like there's certain amounts of unspoken communication going on on the stage. You mean that all the musicians are competent, and they all know the changes, but uh, the special nights, special times and during a performance sometimes when unspoken communication takes place. Well, if you get your, a band, you know, people that live together, you know, and that's the only way you're going to have a band. Otherwise, you just got a lot of good musicians together. But if people live together and, you know, they move together and travel together, they, you know, it's a lot of little inside things that happen, you know, and, you know, so... That's, that always goes on, too, you know. But that just comes from being together, you know. What would you say to our uh, young musicians about the blues? <laughs> what do you mean about the blues? <laughs> well, 
We've had some. Try to make them turn green. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> That's the best That's thing tune. I can tell you about it. <laughs> yeah. As a, as a, as a uh, you know, a form of music, was it, when were you aware of, you know, learning, was it something that you played on earlier in your, in your career as an improviser? Yeah, well, you know, I, you know, I came up in the, in the Southwest, you know. I, yeah. It's something that you come up with just like anything else, you know. Like water, <laughs> you know, it's there, you know. Yeah. And, and it was, uh, you know, a lot of that influence came from uh, blues singers and, and guitar players and then uh, sounds, you know, like all, all from... Like things in Africa, they come from field sounds, and in in this country, it used to come a lot, a lot of things used to come from train sounds, train whistles. You know, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, because you know you could always tell who the engineer was by the way he blew the whistle. You know, so a lot of that you know comes from you know sounds that you hear in the, you know in the environment. They all come and guitar players, you know, that imitates blues singers, you know, and it all gets incorporated in them. It's a, it's a way of life, you know, yeah. and that's what it is. But the only thing that I would say to all students, <clears throat> I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, you have to study and, 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 and be uh, efficient technically, you know, and then you have to have endurance and, and you, you know, you have to, so, it's so much that you just have to do for so long. But really, a lot of that isn't music. You know, it's, I mean. It's more like have, calisthenics? No, it's, uh, they're etudes, and uh -huh. etudes are studies, and that's what they were meant to be, and that's what they are. You know, because uh, you can't consider most etudes is music because they're not, you know, they were designed to do a certain thing, you know, technically, you know, so, yeah. but, but, you know, most students, they, they spend so much time doing that, when they come out and start to play and they think they're making music, you know, when, mm. when it's got nothing to do with that, you know. It's two different things, you know, if I could be the greatest saxophone player in the world and not be able to make a note of music. Two different things, you know. Ah. See, so they have to get. You almost have to forget that, you know. Learn it. Learn it. Yeah, yeah, and then it. forget it, and then make <laughs> some music, you know. Right. You know what I mean? Because I, I've, it's been my observation that uh, all good music, regardless of what type it is, European music, whatever, I don't care, any kind of music, it's all. Uh, uh, a matter of, uh, well, well, it's an extension of us, you know, actually. Music is just an extension of us. And we, as a part of the universe, uh, we operate the same way. It's a matter of tension and release. And in music, it's the same thing, you see what I mean? And in the best music, I've noticed it, uh, it's the artful use of that tension and release that makes the music, using the components of music, which are first rhythm, because you can have rhythm without melody or harmony, you know, and then melody and harmony, and the one that's ignored so much, which is just as important, is silence. <laughs> because yeah. that is the ultimate release to sound. Uh-huh. And it's the silence that makes the sound important. Uh-huh. So if you keep on playing, it gets to be more and more meaningless as you go. You, know? uh -huh. you see, so so you have to consider. I guess Basie was a good example of that. Oh yeah, well it's a, it's a matter of communicating, you know, it's a, as opposed to self gratification, you know, which is not nice in public. <laughs> so you know. So kids, you know, they really gradually grew out of that, but if, if some of them naturally understand that, but I mean, there's some that, quite a few that don't, you know. 
So they so so wrapped up in playing the instrument and you know and the patterns and all the things that they've learned and trying to get out there. You know what I mean? They forget about they supposed to be making music and communicating. You know, which is altogether a different thing. You know? yeah, some cats could do more with you know like all the old cats. They didn't have they didn't use all the complex harmonies that we use today, but. They built a better house than, you know, with just the hammer and the nail you did with all the electric saws and stuff, you know. <laughs> so it's a matter of making music. It's got nothing to do with all that other stuff, you know. So that's what students should really think about, you know. That's the hardest thing to teach, too. Yeah, though. well, you can't yeah. teach that. Music is, well, the only thing you can do, somebody that is, uh, has potential, you just have to make them aware of that. You can't teach them that. You make them aware of it, and then mm -hmm. they handle it in their way, you know. You can't teach anybody. You, know. you can put it there, you know, but as far as teaching, that's, that's, you know, that's another thing. You can coach, but you can't yeah, teach. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it has a lot to do with how much they've listened to as they grow up in their, their yeah, life Yeah, yeah, well, well, and how much they listen to every day. You know, you yeah. have to listen, and, and, and it's, I think, you know, it's a lot of things you shouldn't listen to because you are influenced by whatever you hear. I mean, whether you like it or not, uh -huh. you know, so it's just so many things that you shouldn't even listen to, you know. <laughs> Because, you know, everything you hear over the radio ain't the gospel, you know, and everything you read in the paper ain't the gospel, you know. Mm -hmm. Those people are making deadlines and making money. That's got <laughs> nothing to do with, with what, what, what is actually the fact, you know. In fact, uh, someone was t talking to me about that one day, and I, I told him, I said, I think we live in a tabloid society. Yeah, well, that's what, you know, people are making it, and they don't even bother to get the facts. All they had to do is was ask somebody that knows, you know, and, and they would say, no, oh, this is so and so. They would go right on and some kind of uh, uh, a critic in Japan uh, wrote an article on me said I was, uh, uh, I worked in the post office for years before I joined Macy, you know. Well, that's, you know, that's, you know. Maybe somebody told him that or something. I don't know, but he didn't bother to find out. He just you know, he's making a deadline, so he writes it, you know. Yeah. Right. And then you know, there's another thing. People like Lester, he's not on like the editing in the thing because in the contract because people without knowing it can put things in a different context the way they understand it. But that's got nothing to do with what I meant. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the reason I don't give interviews <laughs> because okay. I've had so many times I talk to somebody and then when I, I read what, what they said, it's it got nothing to do with what I was saying. But it was from their point of view what yeah. it was, or maybe they wanted to make it or sensational they, or something. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> or if they chop off the whole part leading yeah, up yeah, to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then it's a whole yeah. different thing. You right. see, you can't you can't edit stuff. You you know you. Just because you don't understand it the way I say it, you know, don't mean that you can change it the way you want it, you know. It's it like some chick came up to me, she's writing a book about Joe Williams, and she felt that she needed something sensational in the book, so she comes up to me and said, I heard you drew a knife on Sonny Payne's girlfriend. You know, I don't what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, you know, they, she wanted something, you know, to... To mm. spice up a book, you know. What the hell is that? You know, I say, you can write it if you want to, but you can talk to my lawyer, <laughs> you know. It's ridiculous, but I, they don't care, you know, that really. And then the, another thing that, 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 that bothers you about that is that has nothing to do with the quality of the music, yeah. the art form, yeah. or the cultural context. That's right, yeah. they, Well, they don't care about that. They're making a deadline, that's what it is. Yeah. As I've seen a lot of the, the better known critics, you know, go, hey, hey Frank, did you did you hear this? Yeah, who's with him? How you sound? He said, you know, like I ain't got time to get a hold of that. What was it? You know, it's all right, yeah, okay. He's like, it's column, he's gone. Right. He's just got so much work to do, he hasn't got time to cover everything he's got to cover and he's got to get the article out, you know what I, I mean? See. So you know. 
But people believe what they read, you know, uh -huh. which, is, which is not good, you know, because a lot of it has got nothing to do with what's going on. You know, this is uh, something that one of uh, the other musicians that we interviewed talked about. He said, it's important to hear this music live. Yes, it is. <clears throat> and uh, the reason why I thought that was so, and I'd like you to elaborate on this, is when I hear something live, I make an immediate value judgment about how that music is affecting me. Mm -hmm. When uh, the artist finishes a piece, if I really enjoy that piece, I, I clap my hands. Mm -hmm. Sure. And because that music moved me, yeah. at, I was I was participating in the moment yeah. with what that person was playing. Well, that's or what saying. it's about. It's communication, you know. And you feel that. And people feel when 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 the music is being made in front of them. It's like watching somebody cook a dish, you know, and you uh -huh. put some of this in it, some of it, and people can tell when it's not contrived and uh -huh. when you're actually uh -huh. doing it on the spot, you know. Well, yeah. people can tell that, you know, right. and they enjoy that. I mean, mistakes and all, they enjoy right. it uh -huh. because it's, it's natural, you know. Yeah, that's what creation is all about. Yeah, it would be even be much better if, if, if uh, recording engineers would come out in the room and hear <coughs> the music they trying to record before they listen over those speakers, you know. Uh -huh. Because most of them don't have the slightest idea what they record. You know, all they hear is what comes over that speaker. They don't ever come out in the room and listen to the band mm -hmm. to really hear what's going on, you know. And yeah. it's hard to get them out there, too. They got to stand up and, you know. Uh -huh. that's, that's they move away from their knobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. That's, that's the security blanket. But actually, it's really got nothing. You know, if you're going to make an authentic reproduction of something, you have to know what you're trying to reproduce. Know what the real thing sounds like. Right. That's right. Before you find out what the, what the, what yeah. the mechanized thing sounds like. That's right. What are you doing? But, you know, that's our business, so we have to suffer that a lot of times. Well, we've had some, some great insights from uh, our guest today, and we know you have to perform tonight. Yeah. So we're going to let you I go. hope it'll be better than the other night. I was so tired, I could not stand up. Yeah. yeah. Sounded good to me. I was there. Well, well, you know, I've been up all day. I've got about four hours sleep and got up 7 o'clock and went on, you know, all day. And then 10 o'clock at night, you got to be beautiful, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You're on now. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Forget we got a, yeah. Everybody was tired, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got a good band <laughs> with you. Yeah. It's, it's nice. Yeah, well, well I, I tried to make sure that the sound was right before we started. Yeah. So I went out in the room, you know, to hear myself, because that's another thing. You can't trust sound, man. Right. You cannot. I don't care where they are, Carnegie Hall, any place else. You cannot trust them, because they don't. They, they have their own agenda. Yeah, which has got I? nothing to do or with they, or, or they have their own concept of what they think you sound that's like. That's right. You know, and they don't know. You know, they, they really don't. And then when it gets when it gets messed up, then they start, you know. Or if they get excited by the music, they start changing, you know. You know, if you, you know, they will take all control. If if you want to play soft, they turn you up. Say, oh, I can't hear. I can uh -huh. turn you up. If you want to play loud, they turn. Oh no, that's too loud. Yeah. You know, right. What the hell is that? You know? <laughs> well, that's you know that's. That's the reason I like Phil Woods' idea of playing acoustics, <laughs> and you don't have to bother with that, you know. But well, that's what happens, you know. I'm going to say thanks to Frank West and uh, for the on behalf of the Hamilton Jazz Archives and uh, appreciate your thoughts with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much.